Hello everyone. I would like to welcome you to tonight's introductory course of What Now? This will be lesson one and lesson one is entitled From Pew to Purpose. This is the introductory lesson to our series titled What Now? This course is designed to help the new convert become established in the kingdom of God and to lay a firm foundation upon which they can build their Christian life and also to live a life of fulfillment and more importantly, involvement in God's kingdom, more specifically, the church. This course is also for the saint who has been in church for a little while or maybe a little longer. Maybe you've asked yourself out of frustration, isn't there more than this? Or what now? You're frustrated because you haven't found your place or your purpose in God's kingdom. You're faithful to attending God's house you give faithfully in tithing and offering. You show up when there's work details and you serve others at things like Solid Rock and Boom or other church events that we may have. And yet you're not satisfied. You don't feel complete. And you find yourself asking the question that is, what now? And that is the question that this course is founded on. You can't be involved or be busy just to occupy your time or to feel like you're important to God's kingdom. You have to be involved in fulfilling your purpose in the kingdom of God. No one knew more about building than Jesus Christ. After all, he was a carpenter like his earthly dad, Joseph. Joseph taught him the, the trade at a very early age and the importance of being precise in everything you do. Whether it be cutting your wood or sanding your wood, or even the type of wood that you choose. Some woods are hard and sturdy, and yet others are soft and pliable. Some receive stains better than others, while others are meant to stand alone with no stains so that their natural beauty shows through the sealer or the shellac that is applied. In Exodus chapter 25 and verse 9, God spoke to Moses, and he said, According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So we find in the very beginning that God had a very specific plan and a very specific pattern of how he wanted things to be made. That specific plan was for the tabernacle, which was the place where God would abide. Genesis 25 and verse 8 says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. There was a specific plan for those like Aaron who would minister in the holy place or those who would work with fine linens such as blue and purple and scarlet. Those who would work in making the utensils that were to be used inside the tabernacle and at the altar. The instruments were, that were to be made of gold, brass and of silver. And the coverings that were specifically designed to be on the outside of the tabernacle, which were made of ram skin dyed red and badger skin for the outer coverings. And specifically, shittim wood, which was made for the post that would be in the tabernacle. There was specific oil that was to be used for the light and spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense. So let's ask ourselves, if God is so specific in how he wants his house to be constructed and the specific items he wants inside, then don't you think that he has a specific place for you to work and a specific place that he wants or a specific job that he wants you to accomplish? You see, it is when we find our place in God's kingdom that we find our greatest fulfillment and joy because we are where he designed for us to be. Life is like a carpenter's wood shop. We are building together with God a vessel that is pleasing unto him. And a vessel or instrument that is to be used for a specific purpose. That individual instrument then becomes a part of a larger plan or project that God is putting together. 
just as we are building our individual projects or lives, the church as a whole is made up of individual pieces that must be made precisely so that they will fit into the master's plan perfectly. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 13 through 20 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? Or if the whole hearing, where were the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it has pleased him. The most disgruntled or the most unhappy saint in the church is the one that has not found that place where God wants him or her to be. You know, I love to sit and watch children play with um, the toy that is designed for infants. It's called the Intelligent Building Block Toy Set. You know it, the one. It's the one that has the different cutouts and corresponding pieces that match the holes, like squares, hearts, circles, stars, triangles, half circles, moons, or cylinders. It's when they figure out how to put the right pieces in the right hole that they are so overjoyed and excited and happy. But when they can't figure it out, then they become violent angry and start to pout and start to throw the toys and this is a stupid toy and I don't like it but it's because they haven't found out how to put the right pieces in the right holes and they become frustrated with the whole process sometimes we are the same as those children we try to fit square pieces into round holes and we become disgruntled with the process when what we are trying to do just doesn't work. Have you ever heard the term trying to fit a round peg into a square hole? Sometimes that's where we are in, in our walk with God or in our trying to develop our relationship with God. You see, we are all like a giant jigsaw puzzle. There are many different pieces. Some have 50 pieces. Some have 250 pieces, some a thousand, some 5,000. We are all individual pieces that make up this jigsaw puzzle we call the church or the body of Christ. But there is only one way that the jigsaw puzzle can be assembled. For each piece is cut out of the main picture in a certain way so that for the picture to be complete, it can only be reassembled in one way. And that way is the way that the master designer designed for that puzzle to be assembled. Just as the frustration with small children trying to fit the wrong piece into the wrong hole. So you get frustrated with the jigsaw puzzle if you try to assemble pieces together even though they may be, be the same color scheme. It may look like sky. It may look like flowers. It may look like something that you see that the total picture is supposed to be. But when you get to where the cutouts are and how they fitly join together, when you try to put it together, then you find it doesn't fit and it, it doesn't make, make the puzzle come together the way you want it to. So you have to keep searching through that whole pile of, of pieces until you find the right piece that fits exactly where it goes. And sometimes that's how, that's how our life is. Sometimes we are trying to find pieces that fit into the puzzle and we just can't seem to find the right piece that fits in the right place. 
You know, I love Texas Roadhouse. I love the experience there. I love to go there and eat. The service is great, and the food is always pleasing to eat. But for Texas Roadhouse to be so popular and so good that it draws customers back again and again, and that these customers relay by word of mouth telling their friends who may not have ever been there, man, you need to go Texas Roadhouse. Man, it's, it's the place. That's where you need to go. You want to get you some good food and good atmosphere and a good service, you need to go to Texas Roadhouse and go check it out. For the Texas Roadhouse experience to be everything that it is intended to be, there must be a plan to creating that experience. It just doesn't come together by accident. There has to be a specific plan that comes together that makes the Texas Roadhouse experience everything that is supposed to be. First of all, there must be an owner or a general manager who has a desire to put forth a product that he believes so strongly in and that he knows that if others are able to partake of it and experience it, that they are going to feel the same way that he does. There must be a, a owner or a general manager who runs the place whose heart is set on every customer going away satisfied. He doesn't want one customer to have a bad experience at Texas Roadhouse. If your steak doesn't come out exactly how you want it, they will cook you another one until they get it exactly the way that you have ordered it. Why? It's because they are putting forth a product, and that product, they want it to be exactly what you imagined in your mind it would be and exactly what you had your heart set on it being. So their desire is that every customer goes away satisfied with their Texas Roadhouse experience. Secondly, there must be a trained waiter or waitress staff that puts the customer's needs and wants before anything else so that the experience is everything that they expected. Sometimes I'll go and, and I may not get enough salad dressing and I'll ask the waitress if she or waiter if they can bring me a little bit more uh, ranch dressing or if they can bring me some regular butter instead of the honey cinnamon butter for the rolls. And, and they are always so gracious and so, um, so desirous to give you everything that you need so that your experience is everything that you expected it to be because they're their livelihood, their job is dependent upon having a customer that desires to come to Texas Roadhouse and, and eat dinner there. There also has to be a cook staff, not just any kind of cook staff. You just can't grab somebody off the street and pull them in and have them be the cook. But it's got to be a cook staff that has been trained on the proper way to cook a steak. They've got it down to where they have it timed. Uh, some are medium rare, some are medium, some are well done. So they have it timed exactly. How, how long do I cook it on this side and cook it on the other side for it to come out rare or for it to come out medium rare or medium well or well done, however the customer wants it cooked. The point is that the customer must get his or her, her food exactly cooked the way they want it. They don't want a lot of food to turn back to the kitchen. And that only happens if you have a cook staff that has not been properly trained on the proper way to cook a steak. So they go through painstaking efforts to make sure that their cook staff is fully trained on how to cook a steak the Texas Roadhouse way. And lastly, but not least, <clears throat> there must be a customer who comes after their first visit and are so pleased with the total experience that they make a conscious choice to spend their hard-earned money at Texas Roadhouse when they're looking for a night out for dinner. So the staff at Texas Roadhouse wants you to be so, so enamored, so enthralled, so joyous about your experience there that you're willing to come back time and time and time again because you're getting good food cooked the way you want it. You're getting great service from friendly uh, waitresses and waiters. And the whole experience, 
everything combined together is making the Texas Roadhouse experience everything that they want it to be for their customers. If Texas Roadhouse is lacking in any one of these areas, the results affect all of the other areas that are mentioned. If the cook and the manager have been into it and they're having a disagreement, your steak might not be exactly the way you ordered it. Why? Because the cook has, has his mind is preoccupied. He's thinking and contemplating on the conversation he had with the manager earlier. And he may not be totally focused on cooking in the kitchen the way everything is supposed to be. If a couple of the waitresses are fussing with each other, um, other than your waitress might get your whole order completely messed up because they're fussing with each other. They're not, they're not paying attention to what they're doing. They may not have even heard your order the way you said it. You may have said you wanted Coke and they, they brought you out Dr. Pepper. Uh, you may have said you wanted sweet tea and they just brought you out regular tea. It's because they're fussing with the other waitress and their mind is not on what they're doing and they're not paying attention to details. And your order could be completely messed up. And what that would do was that would create a bad experience at Texas Roadhouse. And why would this be? It's because they are not working together to make the Texas Roadhouse be the best that it, that it can be. It can be the same way in church sometimes. If someone is trying to um, fill a position that God didn't call them into, the results for the congregation or for the church could be disastrous. Imagine if the camera guy was trying to preach or if the sound guy was trying to play the drums or if the greeter was trying to drive the bus without being trained on how to drive a bus. It wouldn't be long before you would have a lot of frustration going on and that frustration would eventually affect the revival church experience that sinners come to come to experience. You see, sinners know what the apostolic church is supposed to be. And when they hear revival, they expect to come and hear good singing. They expect to hear come and hear lively worship. Everything that we are noted for, the whole experience that everybody knows going to an apostolic church, that experience. But if if things are off, if the camera guy is trying to preach and he has no experience preaching or he hasn't been called to preach, then he's trying to fulfill a position that he hasn't been trained for. Or if the sound guy has no musical talent at all and he's in there trying to play the drums while the church service is going on and he is off beat and it is just one horrendous sound all throughout service, it is going to frustrate everybody in the congregation and it's going to be hard to worship and it's going to be hard to create that sphere of unity so that everyone can get the apostolic revival church experience that they are looking to in, to encounter so that they can feel the touch of God that they need in their life. And so back to our lesson title from pew to purpose for us to know or to be exactly what God wants us to be we need to find that place in his kingdom that we have been chosen and that we have been destined to fulfill. It is not enough just to come to church and to sit on the pew and just sit there and enjoy the music and enjoy the preaching and be satisfied. God has saved us and called us to a greater purpose than that. We are to be his hands to reach the lost. We are to be his feet that takes the gospel out to those that are outside the walls of our church. We are called to be a witness. <clears throat> we may not all be able to preach. We may not all be able to sing. But there is tremendous amount of need in the church. And there are so many positions that need help in the church and positions that someone looking to be involved can fulfill. 
we have door ushers who open the door for folks as they come in, in from the outside. We have greeters that shake your hand and welcome you to the church. We have Sunday school teachers that take the children back and they teach them their Sunday school lessons so that the parents can be free and be out in the congregation and be able to worship and be able to hear uh, what thus saith the word of the Lord and be touched and their, hopefully their lives be changed without the distraction of their children. Um, we have musicians who are able to play skillfully and, and make a joyous noise unto the Lord and who are able to create an atmosphere of, of um, praise and worship. And depending on what kind of song they sing, if it's a faster song, then it gets people excited and gets them in, in a worship kind of mode uh, in, a, in a demonstrative kind of way. Or if it's slower songs that tug at the heart, maybe it causes a tear to fall and trickle down your face and it, it, it tugs at the heartstring and it causes um, a brokenness in the spirit to where um, you realize that you're not where you need to be or you realize that there's more than what you're experiencing in life. And so um, all these things come together and what they do is they create an atmosphere and in that atmosphere, the pastor or the preacher, whoever it may be, comes up to the pulpit and having prayed and studied and fasted and seeking after God for a message for that service. He comes up to the pulpit and he begins to preach the word of God and begins to deliver the burden that God placed upon his heart for that service. You see, there's been times that I've preached and um, wondering if anyone was touched, but then finding out later someone watching on the internet that they were touched and they came back to the church and prayed through to the Holy Ghost or watching someone in the congregation as you're preaching and you can see that, that the words that you're saying are connecting with them and you see them crying and weeping and shaking and shuddering back in the congregation and you know and you can see that God is moving on them and God is touching them. But you see, for people to experience the revival church experience, it just doesn't come by one person, just like our Texas Roadhouse example, um, without the customer, there is no Texas Roadhouse experience. Without the manager or the owner who wanted to put the restaurant, have it built and put it together and hire waiter, waiter staff and waitresses and hire um, cooks and hire other, other managers to help him manage the place to make it the best experience that it can be. The church is the same way. If the greeter isn't at the front door greeting, making people feel welcome, then it's not going to be the same experience. If there's not friendly saints who go around and, and greet visitors and welcome them, shake their hand and welcome them, tell them how glad they are to have them there, then it's not going to be the same experience. If there's no ushers to help people find their seats or to help people direct, direct, direct them and help them find their way to Sunday school classes or of the such, if there's no Sunday school teachers in the back who have dedicated all week long to preparing a lesson and making it fun and entertaining for the children, then it's not going to be the same experience. If there's not a preacher or a pastor who has studied and sought after God for a word for that night's service, then it's not going to be the same experience. If the praise singers and the musicians haven't practiced and haven't, haven't dedicated to give God their very best for that night's service, then someone's going to come in needing a touch from God and they're not going to have the experience that they need to have. It all works together. It's just like the jigsaw puzzle that I talked about earlier. Everything is fitly framed together and joined together. And God knows what piece needs to be where and who needs to be uh, filling that position to make his kingdom everything that he wants it to be. What we need to do is we need to pray and we need to seek after God and ask him, where do I fit into your plan? Where do you need me to be so that I fit into your plan? Lord, I know that there is something for me to do. I don't know what to get involved in. I don't know where to go, but I know that I need to do more than just sit on the pew. And so that's what this course is designed to help you do. This course is designed 
to teach you, to help you get grounded in the church, to help you find that place in your Christian walk and in, in your, your experience with God so that instead of just sitting on the pew and not being fulfilled or not feeling like you're a part, the design of this course is to help you find your purpose because it's when you find your purpose that joy and fulfillment and excitement and desire will fill your life and you won't be wondering where do I belong or, or what now you will know for a certainty of where you are supposed to be and what you are supposed to be doing. So you can come and you can sit on the pew and never be involved, but eventually you're going to get burnt out. Eventually you're going to get tired because you, you're just taking in, taking in, but you're not giving back out. And the kingdom of God is designed that when you, when you get blessed at church or when you take something in and you tell others on the job or you tell your other family members about the great things that God is doing, have you ever noticed that when you tell others and when you testify about the things that God is doing, how, how much more blessing comes your way? It's because God has chosen each one of us as a particular tool or a particular piece of the puzzle. And it's like when we all join together exactly and let God put us where he needs us to be, it's when that puzzle completely comes together that you have this beautiful picture of a castle on a flowery hillside with forest all around. And it's such a beautiful picture. And it captures the eye and it draws the attention and it brings joy and happiness to the one that is putting the puzzle together. But if you don't have each one of those pieces fitly joined together and framed together the way that the picture intended for them to be, then you have a jumbled mess and the picture doesn't bring out the beauty and, and the joy that it is intended to. So what we need to do as we're as we're developing our walk with God and as we're trying to figure out where we belong is to seek after God. Ask, ask around the church, ask the pastor. There are plenty of things that, that need to be done and the pastor can tell you um, what, what things need to be done, where he needs help and what it takes to fulfill those, those positions. Just like with Texas Roadhouse, it takes, it takes training. It takes uh, time and, and effort. It, it takes study time to be able to fulfill uh, the position and to be able to do the job correctly. They just can't walk in off the street and, and be a cook, or they just can't walk in off the street and be a waiter or be the general manager who owns the place and runs the place, but it takes some training. So maybe in, in, your, uh, in your walk with God and in your quiet time, pastor can help you understand some things that need to be done or, or some things that you need training in to be able to equip you to be able to do the job that God has called you to do. And if you're a seasoned saint and you're in the church and you, you're wondering to yourself, why don't I feel, feel fulfilled? Why don't I feel like, like I matter? Or why don't I feel like, like I'm a part of everything that is going on? Well, maybe you need to ask yourself, what am I doing to facilitate my growth? Am I just coming and sitting on the pew and, and not looking to be involved? Or do you see needs around the church? Do you see that the church needs to be cleaned? You see that the bathrooms need to be swept up and the floors need to be mopped. There is no menial job in the house of God because all of these jobs that come together, what they are doing is they are glorifying and magnifying the king that we serve. And we want his house to be the best looking house of all the houses. Because this is a place where we meet God. This is a place where we worship God. And this is the place where we come and bring our friends so that they can find the same peace and the same joy and the same fulfillment that we feel. I want to thank you for being a part of tonight's lesson from Pew to Purpose. And if I could leave you with one parting word, it would be to don't settle for just being in the pew. 
don't settle for being a part-time attendee, but jump in with everything in you. Jump in with all of your ability and with all of your skills and give God your very best. Pray and seek after God and ask him, Lord, I want to be used wherever you can use me. I would rather be a greeter in the house of God than to be the richest man in the world and be lost for eternity. Because that job of being a greeter at the door is just as important as the job of the pastor up in the pulpit preaching the word of God. Because if there's not a friendly face and a friendly smile that greets you and makes you feel welcomed when you come in the door, the pastor can preach a masterpiece or whoever's preaching can pe preach a masterpiece, the best sermon they've ever preached. But if these people feel offended or turned off before they even get into the sanctuary and are able to hear, then that's one lost opportunity. And we may never get that opportunity again. So every job and every position in God's house is important. And we're not doing it for ourselves. We're not doing it to serve the pastor. Or we're not doing it to make a name for ourselves. We are doing it for the Lord and God that saved us. We are doing it for Jesus Christ who died on the cross so that we could be free. So that we could escape our sin and escape the punishment of our sin. And what we are doing is we are all working together, many pieces, many members, in one body that is creating an atmosphere and an experience so that the next soul that comes in off the street can feel everything that we felt when God saved us and filled us with the Holy Ghost so that we can be everything God wants us to be. I want to thank you for being a part of tonight's lesson I ask that God tremendously blesses you and, and gives you direction and helps you to find that place in him where you can find your purpose in him and find your joy and find your fulfillment. God bless you and thank you for being here tonight. May the Lord bless you.